I will highly recommend you to take these seven questions in form of a quiz, taking not more than five minutes to solve them. Once you have got your answers, only then you listen to the discussion. There are seven questions. The first one is on 6G technology. The next question is on Chandrayaan 3. Then we have one simple question on right to health. We have another question on tuberculosis. The synthesis report of IPCC is making round in the news. So we have one question on IPCC. You must have read about China's involvement in the Solomon port. We have another question on ports that keep making news. You must have read in yesterday's newspaper about Kuki group of tribes. So we have a simple match the column type question based on tribes. There was a news article in the Indian Express regarding India's plan to roll out high speed internet by 2030. Higher than 5G, that is 6G. 4G, 5G, 6G technologies, these are important areas under under IT mentioned in the syllabus of science and tech of GS mains. UPSC previously in 2019 has asked about LTE and voice over LTE. LTE is the standard for 4G. So both LTE and voice over LTE, they are marketed as 4G, not 3G. LTE is the internet packet service. It was started by Airtel in 2012. And voice over LTE was actually started by Jio in 2016. Voice over LTE means that the data packets can be used for voice communication. And when you are on the call, your internet service will not be disrupted. You might not remember the experience of before 2016. When you were on the call, the internet service was disrupted. That was LTE. So voice over LTE is not voice only technology. It is voice over internet service. Voice using the data package. So the answer to this question would be option D. Now let's consider this question on 6G technology. 6G network can offer much faster data transfer speed than 5G. Of course, that's a gradual progression from 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G to 6G. And that will allow near instantaneous downloads and uploads. The speed of 4G was up to 1 Gbps. For 5G, it is up to 10 Gbps. For 6G, supposedly, it will be 1 Tbps, 1000 Gbps. The latency in 4G that most of us still have is around 20 milliseconds, between 10 to 30 milliseconds. In the best service of 5G, it will be up to 5 milliseconds. In 6G, it will be less than 1 millisecond. That will be almost instantaneous. 6G network will enable the development of new applications and technologies such as holographic communication and immersive virtual reality experience. These are futuristic technology, but they will work only if latency is very less or to say the speed is very high. So 6G technology, of course, will enable them. 6G network will require less infrastructure to achieve the same coverage as 5G network, reducing cost and improving network efficiency. So you understand as we move from 4G to 5G, the infrastructural requirement was more. And as we move from 5G to 6G, the infrastructural requirement will be much, much more. The reason you can already understand from this jump of 1 Gbps to 10 Gbps and from 10 Gbps to 1000 Gbps. These speed are related with frequencies. In every cycle, one data packet is transferred. So if you increase the frequency of the wave, then one cycle will be smaller and hence the rate of transmission of data packet will increase. If you further increase the frequency of a wave, then the speed with which the data can be transferred will be even faster because one cycle will transfer one data packet. So to get extremely high speed, you require extremely high frequency. But the problem is that everything comes at a cost. Waves with extremely high frequency at attenuation in them is also extremely high meaning they disperse very rapidly and their strength decreases very rapidly. So there will be requirement of huge infrastructure and you would require huge size of antenna to receive them. Apart from this, this terahertz frequency that, that will give you the speed of terabytes per second, it will require special material to produce such high frequency. So it will require materials like graphene and carbon nanotubes to produce and receive radiation of such high frequency. So a lot of research has to go into to make this possible. High frequency also means high energy. High energy would means high carbon footprint. So to make the technology sustainable, the energy efficiency has to increase. So the network efficiency has to be very, very high. So new materials are now being researched upon to increase the network efficiency. All in all, the infrastructural requirement will be very high. No country has still achieved 6G technology. Researches are still going on because 6G cannot be rolled out with present level of technology. We do not have such high network efficiency. And with low efficiency, if you start consuming more power, the carbon footprint will be very high. And you have to consume more power because of high frequency requirement. Higher the frequency, higher the energy of the wave. So answer here seems to be 1, 2 and 4.
There was a news article in the Hindu on Chandrayaan 3. UPSC keep on asking about the space exploration program. And if it's a flagship program of India, UPSC will ask about it. In 2016, UPSC has asked about a flagship space program of India, Mars Orbiter Mission. India was the fourth country to put a spacecraft in the orbit of Mars. But India was the first country to be successful in making its spacecraft orbit the Mars in the very first attempt. But unfortunately, when it came to soft landing on Moon, India couldn't make it in the first attempt. With reference to Chandrayaan-3, consider the following statements. It will be India's first attempt to land on the lunar south pole. India already had its first attempt in Chandrayaan-2. Chandrayaan-2 was also to land on the lunar south pole. But just 100 km above the surface, something went wrong and we couldn't achieve the soft landing. But by and large, the purpose of the mission was solved. Chandrayaan-2 had Chandrayaan-2 collected too much data to help the scientific community. So Chandrayaan-3 is not the first attempt to land on the lunar south pole. It is a robotic mission that will have a lander and a rover. It is not a manned mission. There is no plan to establish a permanent lunar base for human exploration as part of Chandrayaan-3. NASA has been trying to do it. There is also a joint collaboration between China and Russia to establish a lunar base, either on the surface or in the form of an orbiter around the moon on the line of International Space Station. But presently, India has no such plan. It will carry a rover to explore the lunar surface. The rover will rove around 100 km on the lunar surface. It will collect the sample to do the studies, but it will not bring it back on Earth. The objective of Chandrayaan-3 mission are three. One, to have a soft landing. Two, to rove on the surface of the moon. And three, to conduct in situ experiment. Bringing the sample back on Earth is really a sophisticated mission to perform. And India has no such plan with Chandrayaan-3 maybe sometime in future. But the sample from the moon has been brought back, back in 1970s, with a series of lunar mission of Russia. China also has done it in its Chang-5 mission. Presently, the Perseverance rover of NASA roving on the surface of Mars. It will collect the sample and there will be a joint program between NASA and European Space Agency to bring back sample from Mars. NASA's Oris rex mission. The mission is on its way to bring back sample from the asteroid Bennu. The sample is supposed to come to the Earth somewhere in mid-2023. It's also worth mentioning here in 2010, Japanese mission Hayabusa. It was the first mission to bring back a sample from asteroid back on Earth. So these are the important missions concerning bringing back sample from space back on Earth. But no such plan is there with Chandrayaan-3. The answer here should be option D. You must have been reading about the right to health bill of Rajasthan and the opposition. The discussion already has been done in the DNS. Here we'll take a simple question on right to health. UPSA in 2019 has asked a question on right to marry a person of one's choice. That comes from Article 21. Supreme Court has expanded the scope of Article 21 using the doctrine of implied fundamental right. So within the right to life and liberty, many other implied fundamental rights have been included. And one of that is right to health. Right to health is not explicitly mentioned as a fundamental right in the Constitution of India. It's a correct statement, but it's an implied right under Article 21. So right to health is a fundamental right. Right to health is not justifiable and cannot be enforced through the courts in India. Fundamental rights are justifiable. DPSP are not justifiable. If you look at it from the point of view of Article 41, Article 47, it's not justifiable. But since it has been brought under the scope of Article 21, so now it's a fundamental right. And fundamental rights are justifiable. The statement is plainly incorrect. There was an article in the Hindu, The Road to Ending Tuberculosis. Let's consider this question. TB is a bacterial infection that primarily affects the lungs but can also affect other parts of the body. Yes, like kidney, liver, spines or any other part of the body. The statement is absolutely correct and it's a bacterial infection. BCG vaccine provides complete protection against all forms of TB including multi-drug resistant TB and is recommended for all individuals. The statement sounds so extreme, it is bound to be incorrect. BCG vaccine, of course, is a vaccine against TB. It is administered to children, but it does not provide complete protection because in adulthood, you can still get TB. And a revaccination of BCG in adulthood doesn't seem to work properly. And it does not provide protection against multi-drug resistant TB. The statement is incorrect. The third statement is factual and correct. Pradhan Mantri TB Mukt Bharat Abhiyan campaign is a community-led initiative where the community is encouraged to provide support to the TB patients in the form of nutritional supplement, vocational support for a period, for a period of 6 months to 3 years. World Health Organization has set a target to eliminate TB globally by 2050. 
This statement is also factual and correct. WHO has come up with end TB strategy, where the aim is to reduce the fertility by TB by 90% and to reduce the incidence of TB by 80% by 2035 compared to the level of 2015 and to eliminate TB by 2050. And elimination means less than one case per million per year. So the answer would be option D. You must also be reading about the IPCC synthesis report. You have to extract the data, the recommendations from the report for your mains exam. But here we shall discuss a simple question on IPCC. IPCC was established in 1988 by United Nations Environment Program and World Meteorological Organization. It's a factual statement. It's a correct statement. They were in need of some scientific study and hence they established IPCC. IPCC is a policy making body and makes recommendation to governments on how to mitigate and adapt to climate change. IPCC is not a policy making body and it does not make recommendation to government. It just gives scientific data that is intended to give help to the government in having an informed decision making on the issue of climate change. So it put forward scientific data in public domain. That's it. Now the government can be persuaded to use that data, but it does not give direct recommendation to governments and it is not a policy making body at all. Greenhouse gas protocol operates under the AGs of IPCC. IPCC just do study and put the data in public domain. Nothing more than that. However, greenhouse gas protocol is an important accounting tool. UPSC asked about it in 2016. Now when we have done the study on climate change and we have set the climate change related targets, it's very important to monitor in real time our climate change related targets. So for that purpose, we need some accounting tool. Greenhouse gas protocol is one such popularly used international accounting tool where the government or the bill where the government and other businesses can understand, quantify and manage the greenhouse gas emission. But this protocol is not under the ages of IPCC. When you study a body, you have to understand the nature, the working of that body. So that when a statement like this comes, you really know that the statement is incorrect. IPCC is a research body. It, it does not even do the original research. It compiles the data from other researches and put the authentic data in a scientific manner in the public domain. UPSC has asked questions like this, where when you understand the nature of the body, you can easily eliminate those options. For example, in 2021, UPSC in relation to water credit has given one option that it's a global initiative launched under the AGs of World Health Organization and World Bank. If you look at option three, this statement is correct because it aims to enable the poor people to meet their water needs without depending on subsidy. How? Through credits, through loans. But that is not the business of World Health Organization to provide credit. It sounds so incorrect. The statement is incorrect. World Bank also doesn't give credits at household level. If you know the nature and the functioning of body, you can easily eliminate these options. UPSC in 2015 has asked about Green Climate Fund. And it was said that it was founded under the AGs of UNEP, OECD, Asian Development Bank and World Bank. All of them put together. It sounds so incorrect. OECD is a research body, of course. But collaboration of these four distinct kind of bodies together, on the face of it, it seems incorrect. Similarly, there was another question in 2016 where they talked about organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons. And one of the statements said, it is an organization of European Union in working relation with NATO and WHO. NATO and WHO. It doesn't fit together. The statement has to be incorrect. So the answer here would be option A, if we can make this change. I'm really sorry about it. There was an article in the Hindu yesterday, China boosts South Pacific influence with Solomon Port Deal. In 2019, Solomon Island and Kiribati, previously they were having diplomatic relation with Taiwan. But in 2019, they changed the side towards China. And since then, China has been involved in helping infrastructure development and otherwise of Solomon Island. And now they have cleansed a deal to develop port in Solomon Island. And hence this question for you. Arrange the following port from west to east. These are the ports that commonly make news. UPSC in 2018 has asked this question, among the following cities, which one lies on the longitude closest to that of Delhi? This was a close call. Hyderabad and Bangalore were quite close by. You can eliminate Pune and Nagpur quite comfortably, but this was a little close call, but, but the question was from NCERT. So UPSC can justify giving this question. This question could be quite difficult and if you ever receive, and if you see this kind of question in the final exam, it's better to leave. The Dukm port in Oman and Agaliga port in the Mauritius, they are close by. They are very, very close by. The longitude of the Dukm port here in Oman is around 56.6 degree east. And the Agaliga port in the Mauritius, this is around 55.4 degree east. 
So among the given option, Agalega port is the westmost. We have to arrange from west to east. So the first one would be option 3. Agalega, then Dukum port, then Chabahar, and then you have to decide between 4 and 5. Sitwe port and port of Sabang. Sitwe port is here in Myanmar, and the port of Sabang is in the tip of Indonesia. It's also a very close call, but as you can see in the map, the port of Sabang will be east to Sitwe port, and the Solomon will come further east. So first the Sitwe port and then the port of Sabang and then the Solomon port. It was challenging but I hope you enjoyed solving it. There was another news article concerning the Kuki group of tribe. UPSC keep on asking about tribes in various forms. Once in 2014, UPSC has asked to match the tribe with the state they belong to. Limu tribe, they are predominantly in Sikkim. Karbi tribe, you must have heard about Karbi and Long region in Assam. So Himachal Pradesh is incorrect match. Dongoria Khond from the famous Niamgari hill in Odisha, it's a correct match. And Bonda tribe, they are also from Odisha. Let's attempt this last question of ours. Kuki tribe, they are from Assam, Manipur and part of Mizoram. It's a correct match. Zarawa tribe, they are particularly vulnerable tribal group from Andaman. The famous Soliga tribe, they are from the Biligiri Ranga hill in the Chamai Rajanagar district in the state of Karnataka. And Bodo tribe are from Jharkhand and West Bengal. So how many of the above pairs are correctly matched? Only one pair.